Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. And we are meeting once again with lecture 11 of drama 2, that is modern drama. And we are continuing with our talk based on um, Sean O'Kesse's play, Juno and the Peacock. In the previous lecture, um, we had a general overview of the plot and we talked about um, things related to themes and um, the culture and the influences and the context of the play. Um, in today's lecture, we are going to talk about two basic aspects um, discussed most, mostly regarding the play. One is that this drama is tragic comedy and second is that it's a feministic play. So, um, we will discuss the drama as a tragic comedy, what makes it tragic comedy, why it is called it, uh, what kind of coexistence of tragedy and comedy um, is present, what are shifts of moods and how they are affecting the honor of the drama. Then we will discuss uh, the feministic approach of the writer. We will discuss the background of the writer's approach, um, Okese's feministic advocacy, uh, how does he um, advocate feminism, masculine representation and feminine representation. Um, this uh, aspect is basically will be discussed uh, to discuss the artistic combination of this clash. Um, how Okese is presenting um, feministic um, approach of his writing by presenting a clash between masculine and feminine characters. And while doing so, we will be discussing Johnny and Mr. Boyle's character as male representation and Junu and Mary's characters um, as female representation. So in, in this question, we are not only discussing the feministic approach of the writer, uh, but we are also um, discussing four of the major characters of the play. So let us start with today's talk. And we are discussing Junu and the Peacock as a tragic comedy. Before that we um, indulge into discussion to understand how the play is a tragic comedy, we need to understand what the term um, refers to. Tragic comedy is a kind of writing in which comedy is hovering on the brinks of tragedy. Okay, to make it easy, uh, comedy is used in order to enhance the tragic elements in the play. Or we can say that comedy is used in order to expand the effects of tragedies happening in the play. At times, comedy is used as ironically in order to let the audience understand the tragic happenings in the play. To make them laugh, however, understand what is happening at the same time. Okay, um, so why um, Juno and the Peacock is a tragic comedy? Okay, since Juno and the Peacock is a tragic comedy, although on the whole it is a serious and somber play having much destruction and violence. We understand the play has its background in Irish civil war, the kind of personal and social influences it bears upon, um, try to give it a kind of um, attitude and mood that is quite serious and somber in nature. Still, we will find um, traces of comedy and heavy traces of comedy which will make you li uh, laugh out of uh, um, uh, top on, uh, on your lungs. But there are a number of comic elements in the play which would not fit into the pattern of a tragedy. So, um, we cannot, although the play is um, very serious in nature, although the play, play, play has heavy traces of comedy, however, this may not fall completely in any of these categories. We cannot call, uh, call the play a complete tragic play or we cannot call the play a complete comic play. So um, as the comic elements do not overweight tragedy uh, and the tragic co uh, elements do not overweight the comic ones, it would be inappropriate to label the play as any of them separately. So that is why play is labeled as tragic comedy. So it's uh, including elements from both uh, genres of drama. 
So, we find that tragedy and comedy both are coexisting, existing together in the drama. It means there is a coexistence in the play of tragic and comic elements. And so, the best course is to treat it as a tragic comedy. So, what makes it a tragedy comedy? What kind of moods and what kind of mood shifts are existing in the drama? Let's have a look at them. The play starts with a graphic description of Boyle's household. As we discussed in lecture 9, what kind of beginning description and graphical description the play has. Um, it opens up in their kind of living room or it's one room, two rooms tenement that they have. So it's open up in their household. The setting reflects the poverty of the dwellers. The setting shows what kind of social status the family has. And we discussed the theme of poverty in the previous lecture in quite a detail. Then the news of murder of Robbie Tancred is also very gloomy. Johnny's neurotic condition adds to the tension of the play. But suddenly, the mood of the play changes when Captain Boyle and Joxer come in. So we see in the beginning the play has quite a serious somber mood where the setting shows poverty, where the murder is disclosed, where Johnny is shown, is, is shown as a neurotic character who is um, suffering because of his dilemma. However, there is a shift of mood by um, the comic characters of the play entering in. It's not that they are totally comic characters or jokers of the play. It's like they keep the appearance of a comic character and comic elements. Um, so we have Captain Boyle and Joxer, his close dear friend, coming in and that changes the mood of the play. So a mood transition takes place. It's from serious to lighter note now. Um, and we see Mr. Boyle as a grotesque character. Um, it's art his articulation, his appearance, his movement. So he is basically a comedy many a times. Comedy of articulation, his speech, comedy of appearance, the kind of dress he is in most of the time. Um, the comedy of the movement, the kind of movements he takes on the stage all make you laugh um, a lot. The description of Mr. Boyle and Joxer's um, uh, physiognomy creates laughter. Uh, the way both talk, the way both speak, and the way both articulate, the way both discuss on things, and the way both describe the things, all is very funny. They are in fact grotesque characters. Mr. Boyle's neck is short, and his head looks like a stone ball on top of a um, gate post. So uh, the kind of appearance that he's keeping in the drama is very funny. Um, grotesque um, in, it, in its literal meaning means a kind of um, fantastically ridiculous uh, kind of uh, thing. So if it is um, described in terms of appearance, you can understand what kind of funny appearance it would be. Um, he carries himself with the upper part of his body slightly thrust forward. His walk is a slow conse consequential thrust. So the way he walks basically is another kind of funny act that creates a lighter mood in the drama. Um, so we can call to some extent Mr. Boyle's character and, Bo and Joxer's character kind of comic relief but not all the times, however most of the times. Um, now uh, the previous um, slide talked about the movement of the shift of mood from serious to lighter mood. Now the mood is shifting again and the transition takes it from lighter to all comedy. Now, how this comedy ha happens? When Jerry Devine enters, the situation becomes more ludicrous, more absurd. Mr. Boyle is not willing to accept the job opportunity brought by Jerry. Jerry brings him a job opportunity and we know that Mr. Boyle does not want to work, does not like to work. He is a kind of apparently aristocratic background. Um, he has lame excuses for not um, accepting the job offer basically makes you laugh a lot. 
We again burst into great laughter when we see Junu hiding herself to catch Joxer and Captain Boyle as they make themselves at home. Since both are sitting at home, so Junu is hiding herself behind um, a kind of obstacle in order to catch Joxer because she thinks he is one main reason um, that Captain Boyle is not able to focus on his responsibilities. Joxer's word a darling man, a darling man, a darling thing, a darling thing is basically his attempt to escape from the situation at the sight of Junu when Junu um, catches them. Mr. Boyle's pretension that he is searching for a job, all this basically, uh, the kind of articulations and the kind of speech um, he produces, um, in contrast to the type of situation they are in, uh, this, this brilliant contrast makes you laugh a lot. So here, when, you, when this all is happening, the, the mood of the play is totally changed from serious to all comedy. And if you are thinking, uh, if you are watching the play, in the beginning you would, you would think it's a, it's a, it's a tragedy, it's a, it's a tragic play. When you reach this point, you will find, oh no, this is a comedy. So let's see what happens in the coming um, transition. Then you will find there are great times of amusement. Um, we analyze a dialogue by um, Captain Boyle. He says, uh, when he's trying to um, create excuses for not doing and accepting the job that um, um, the character brings him, he says, wouldn't be a climbing job. How would you expect me to be able to go up a ladder with these legs? And if I get up a self, how am I going to get down again? <laughs> and we're also much amused when Captain Boyle is interrupted while singing because he is singing and he gets interrupted uh, twice and thrice first by a sewing machine uh, man's entry and then by the thundering knocks at the door and when Boyle invites Joxer to a cup of tea Joxer says I'm afraid the missus are popping on us again before we would know where we are something's telling me to go at wasn't mm, and the boy and this Boyle replies don't be superstitious, man. We are Dublin, man. This is quite funny. We find we see that um, the lady Juno is um, trying to um, have a catch on Joxer because she thinks he's the one who is making um, Captain Boyle responsible and not letting him do anything at all. So she is always in, you know, um, trying to catch on him. Uh, and now um, we, we see that. Joxer is kind of afraid uh, for the reason that she may catch him again and he shares this uh, fear with uh, Mr. Boyle and Mr. Boyle says don't be superstitious men we are Dublin men so in a way it's a kind of ironic situation referring to Dublin men, Dublin men as the men of courage and men of uh, power and men of um, uh, you know determination however what they are do doing is all together um, um, a, a brilliant contrast of situation. Okay, we're also greatly amused when we find Joxer Delhi and Mr. Boyle discussing a, uh, about books and history, uh, but their mock intellectual discussion is interrupted by the voice of a coal vendor. Again, we burst into laughter when Joxer flies out of the window at learning the voice of Junu. So we are finding Junu. Um, uh, um, following Joxer and Joxer basically running uh, because of Juno from here and there. So no matter whether it's a window, he will try to fly out of the place. In fact, this whole episode is fantastically humorous and funny. But in this fun and ludicrous, absurd description, there is a tinge of pathos. There is a tinge of sadness as well. For example, at one place when Juno is... Um, giving breakfast to her husband she says here sit down take your breakfast it may be the last you'll get for I don't know where the next is going to come from so apparently it shows a kind of funny situation where is presenting breakfast to her husband however the kind of articulation she keeps the dialogues tell us the the gravity of matter and that is the that is the reflection of their poverty for she thinks this is going to be the last food last meal that they're having because for the next meal she's not sure where from she'll bring it so um, even in the tragedy even in the comic elements the tragedy is um, coming uh, in front to let the audience know what is the spirit of the play then when there is a knocking at the door and Boyle asks Joxer to 
stuck his head out of the window and see who is there, Jokser replies, um, maybe get a bullet in the kisser. So it shows us the kisser is basically, uh, he refers to the, the lips. And he says, if I'm going to tuck my head out of the window, I may get a bullet right into my lips. Um, apparently, this remarks may be funny and may be very funny, the way Joxer articulate them. But underneath, there is a grim tragedy in it. The tragedy of Ireland destroyed and wasted by civil war. The tragedy of fear prevailing in the society. Boyles remarked that the clergy always had too much power over the people in this unfortunate country. So it's a kind of criticism on the system by this comic character. Again we have a switch of mood and now it's combination. Um, you can see the transition of mood. It was somber, it became lighter, then moved on to comedy, then a little touch of tragedy and now it's going to be a combination of comedy and grim mood. So, um, this again shows the grim situation of Ireland. Thus, here we have an intermingling of light and serious elements of a mixture of comedy and pathos. So, um, in Act 2, we see a fair um, divide of different types of mood, but all setting up together. A lighter mood, a comic mood, a somber mood, a serious mood, a sad mood, all are intermingled together to create, and, uh, to create the color and the feel that the play has. In Act 2, uh, in this Act 2, we, we have much laughter. We see that um, the changed attitude of Boyle at the prospect of false will. Now we see a character, uh, a lame character, a useless, fertile character who has the airs of aristocracy, who thinks of himself as a kind of very noble character, um, a person who would like to fight in the army against enemies, a person who would like to sail in the ocean against the, um, you know, um, against the cruel waves and he thinks very heroic of himself and when he gets this uh, when this this provoking situation gets in he is being informed that he is going to be inherited a will this creates a very kind of funny situation now this character uh, is is being fed with fresh blood of um, uh, imaginative um, fallacy that we see. So this is basically um, this becomes a point of um, laughter for audience. The singing of Juno and Mary is another uh, point to laugh and enjoy and Mrs. Madigan and especially Joxer and Mr. Boyle are amusingly funny in this episode. That is the act two. Although this whole episode is a merely comedy on the background, we can also perceive the tensions of the funeral. Whose funeral is that, by the way? So, Act 3 starts, and now we have traces of different types of moods. In Act 3, where there are much suffering and destruction, you see, Act 2 was full of comedy. Now we see that Act 3 is basically a kind of act where there's a lot of sufferings, a lot of destruction. Even then we find some comic situation here too. Jox's behavior at the um, downfall of Mr. Boyle is very funny. Um, when he finds that Mr. Boyle is not getting any legacy, um, the kind of behavior he keeps is very funny and becomes amusement for the uh, uh, for the audience. He instigates Nogant, the tailor, to get his suit away from Mr. Boyle. Mr. Boyle was, it's a very funny thing basically, Mr. Boyle was, keep, was, get, was dressed up soon after he gets to know that he's going to get um, this legacy, a big amount of money. He, um, he prepares himself to receive the money in the real manner and he gets, he borrowed this suit from the tailor and um, he gets all prepared. However, um, as soon as he gets to know that this, this legacy um, transformation, um, this transfer of legacy was all a mere joke and it's not happening anymore, 
Doctor behaves very funny and he makes fun of Mr. Boyle. And the very first thing he demands is the suit, uh, uh, returning a suit to the tailor. He also stores away a bottle of brandy from the table and Boyle's indignation at the moment creates laughter. So, um, um, now Mr. Boyle is uh, keeping a bottle of brandy, uh, though it is bought through um, the money borrowed from people. However, um, we are shown that uh, initially Mr. Boyle was creating an air that he's a kind of person who would like to, you know, let these um, cripples feed on his money. However, as soon as he knows that he's not going to get any money and he has to return all the money that he has borrowed, um, and at the same point when Joxer is trying to um, steal that Brandy's bottle away the, in the way that he behaves back to Joxer is very funny situation. Actually on the whole farce is in the play. Um, it is verbal because um, through the word play the kind of comedy is created. Through the comic catch phrases the way they articulate um, language and the, the way they um, choose to um, uh, you know, convey their feelings in the kind of language and words. That is very funny. The cumulative comedy of repetition. Darling man, darling man, a darling thing, a darling thing, the way the things are repeated. They create a funny situation. And there's, there is the comedy of dialect and mispronunciation. So the comedy is not only created by the wordplay, by the catchphrases and by the comedy of repetition. It is also... Um, created through the dialect. Um, you see that the way um, the way a literate person would speak um, the same language will not going to be the same as the person who is from the working class will speak no matter if they both possess the same kind of um, vocabulary and the same kind of uh, um, language background. Uh, for example if we, uh, if we consider Punjabi as language the Punjabi dialect is different when it is spoken in Lahore. The Punjabi um, dialect will be different when it is spoken in Murray. It is going to be very different when it is spoken in Nawalpindi. So although the language is same, the background is almost the same. Uh, it's all Punjab. However, when the people of different area and different social status and of different backgrounds will be speaking the similar kind of language, the dialect would change. The understanding and the thing would change. And then the mispronunciation. Uh, we understand that both of these characters are not literate characters. So they are using language, they are misusing language, and they are even mispronouncing the misuse of language. So um, the comedy is also created of the pompous phrases misused um, when they are talking about themselves as very high, um, of ridiculous images by doing absurd things by um, presenting absurd images. Inflation and deflation both are comic. When they talk about money, the rise of the prices and the decrease in the prices. Um, when Boyle thinks he, he's not having money, he talks about the things being very costly. However, but he thinks that he's going to have a big amount of money, he finds them quite cheap in price. Captain Boyle's inflation of his fantasies with invention his exa exaggeration, his rhetoric and bombastic uh, use of language and Junu's faculty facility in knocking him down um, at uh, etc. all are very comic. We find that wherever we find um, Mr. Boyle um, um, getting into a typical kind of character that he's presenting, Miss, Miss, Mrs. Uh, Boyle comes in the scene to, uh, you know, gets him back out at his place and knocking him down and telling him what he really is. Okay, um, now what is this tragic theme? Despite so much laughter and comedy um, that is being presented through various devices that Sean O'Kese uses in his play, the play is predominantly tragic in theme. For example, the ignorance that prompts Joxer's and Captain Boyle's mistake makes us laugh at first, but is fundamentally tragic. Their idleness, their drunkenness, and devi deviceness, um, deviousness give numerous opportunities for comedy but are in themselves wasteful and destructive. So, um, this life of slums 
gives rise to farcical situations but is in reality a grim. Thus the um, super facilities of um, certain circumstances of Dublin of life make an audience laugh whereas these are tragic if examined in full. For example, heroes becomes cowards as the Boyle and Joxer and Johnny are. Um, nationalism becomes jingoism as the Johnny is. Labor, um, humanitarian, humanitarianism becomes inhumanity. So all these things are shown um, in a kind of contrastive situation that again uh, gives a sharp effect of tragedy. Um, moving on with the theme, uh, these are the tragedies of the play which are mingled with comedy to enhance their effect on the audience. So the pith and um, you know in the Peacock, a tragic comedy, the pith and marrow of all this discussion is that comedy is here, in fact hovering on the brink of tragedy and so we are apt and just when we call Juno and the Peacock a tragic comedy. So whatever all the things that we discussed, um, why the play is tragic comedy, what makes it tragic comedy and what are the elements, what are the shifts of moods, if we discuss all of them we are able to um, support our statement that Juno and Peacock is indeed a tragic comedy. So after discussing um, the play as a tragic comedy, we are going to discuss the significance of play as a feministic um, playwright by Sean O'Kese. So what makes it a feministic exercise? Um, we will discuss this um, aspect of the play um, uh, keeping four aspects active. Background of um, Sean's feministic approach. Um, Okese's feministic advocacy, what is basically he is presenting and projecting, masculine representation of Johnny and Mr. Boyle and feminine representation of Juno and Mary. So, like Ibsen and Shaw, Sean Okese is also a feministic playwright, that is um, what we know. His play End of the Beginning, The Shadow of the Gunman and Juno and the Peacock are the three extreme examples of his feministic artistic um, talent. Um, what is the background of his approach um, of feministic writing? The reason of his feministic approach is Okese's great admiration for his mother. You remember in the, in the previous lecture probably in lecture 10 or 9, we discussed um, the writer's background um, and his background um, as in terms of his domestic um, uh, scenario. In his domestic scenario we found that um, Okese lost his father in very early age and that was the point and that was the reason that brought him very close to his mother and he always found his mother um, an image of love and production for her and he admires his mother a lot. Uh, most of his plays you will find different characters resembling or uh, showing um, his motherly affection that he keeps. Um, he led a very miserable life with, his, uh, with uh, his mother in slums. His mother, because he was a family, this was a family uh, without father, we can understand, uh, and this was a family in poverty, and this was a family in the background of Irish Civil War. This would have not been a pleasant experience for all the family members, especially for um, for a child um, who is having several siblings without a father, with a hard working mother. Um, his mother nursed him in very poor circumstances, understandably. In return, he loved her mother very much. So we find um, Okese's love for, her mo for his mother one of the main reasons for his feministic approach towards um, the way he looks at the world. Many of his heroines have glimpses of his mother and they are based on the personality of his mother while facing the adversity. So again this element brings us back to understand that as his mother faced adversity in times and then fought against it with bravery and courage, we find the similar um, elements in the heroines and in the, in the plot related uh, hovering around the heroines in most of his plays. So uh, what is that 
Okese is advocating. Okese advocates that we have to give an equal status to women to progress in the modern world. That is the stance and position he keeps up in all of his writings. And if you are able to recall, this is what Ibsen projects in his writings too. And the play that we um, read last, um, The Doll's House, was um, uh, a kind of play where this was one of the major themes. So um, he finds, Sean O'Kessie finds that women is being victimized and the very element of man flattering women is basically um, the beginning of the whole um, thing for a woman. Like other plays of Okese, Juno and the Peacock also projects the theme of feminism that traditionally man flatters women. In this play, Mary and Juno are flattered and dragged down by their male counterparts, also by their circumstances, however caused by the men. Both worked hard to make both ends meet. We see Juno as a hard-working woman. We see Mary as well as a hard-working woman. She is working in a factory. While men are irresponsible, careless, coward, drunkard, imaginative, and useless, they are not at all ready to pick up any responsibility or to do any betterment for the sake of home. Rather, they are becoming the case of degeneracy for the home and are adding fuel to the fire. Okay, so um, how this impact is created? Sean keeps a very um, uh, um, Sean keeps you know this this art of presenting thing not only uh, showing you one side of the picture but showing you the opposite side of the picture to create that contrastive effect. So in order to really and make you understand the masculine uh, the masculine nature of her feminine uh, her um, female characters, he shows you the masculine representation keeping the traditionally female at attributes attached to female representation in their society. So he brings the, the contrastive feature of the phenomena to, to get you the flavor of what he is trying to um, present here. So uh, we are trying to see how he is projecting men in his work. Uh, men in Okesa's world are Mr. Boyle and Johnny who are important, who are dreamers and who are escapist and also um, scared of facing reality and working for it. So, um, seeing men in Nukes' works, we are trying to analyze Johnny and Mr. Boyle's character. Both of them, they think that one day Ireland must be free and the days of prosperity will come, but women characters, now in the worst circumstances caused by war, suffers most of all in the time of cal uh, calamity. They have to see their husband and sons killed and slaughtered and their lovers burned down. When, uh, when Tancred is murdered, it is Mrs. Tancred who suffers behind him. The words of Mrs. Tancred's um, lamentation on the death of her son always hurts Junu and she already prays for the life of Johnny. Blessed Virgin. Sacred heart, O oh Jesus, take away our hearts, stone and give us hearts of flesh. As the, look at the look at the words. She's saying that the society has become so cruel. It, being, it seems that they are they are keeping the hearts of stone. It's not a human flesh uh, in their body anymore. Okay, um, Captain Boyle, the husband of Juno, is a drunkard, careless irresponsible and a man of straw having no consequence at all. He has never worked in his entire life and in fact is not, uh, does not have any plan for the rest of his life too. And his only business is to peacock about the clubs and pubs with his friend Joxer, um, an equally useless person. They together boost off nationalism, they talk about country, politician, they talk about army, they talk about fights, talk about war. War, however, um, in practical life they do nothing. 
but they never bother about their homes. This is one added feature. It's not, it's not taking the responsibility of society or taking the responsibility of country. First of all, their first um, front should be taking the responsibility of their households, which they do not. Captain Boyle is a typical aristocratic figure who does not care about his wife and children at all. Whenever Juno instigates him and laments him to do work at least for his own sake, if not for the family, he always makes lame excuses and complains about um, pains which do not exist. Uh, sometimes in his legs, the legs with which he can wander around all day long. And this makes me take you again to that um, um, team-oriented dialogue where he's complaining about the job being offered to him and he's uh, creating excuses. Won't it be a climbing job? How do you expect me to be able to go up a ladder with these legs? And if I get up a self, how am I going to get down again? So you can understand the kind of excuse he's creating. Um, now, after knowing the male representation, moving on to women's grief, in the male rep representation, we see Juno, Juno has to suffer um, on different grounds. There are different fronts the, he, she has to fight. She has a husband who keeps on uh, stuttering about from morning till night, whereas she has to carry the burden to her whole family. She is the sole breadwinner of the family. Her son Johnny has lost an arm and has a hip shattered in the war. Um, the daughter who has turned rebel um, and is on strike ultimately gives birth to, a, to an illegitimate child. Um, a school teacher, her fiancé, by a school teacher, her fiancé. Um, in the hell of circumstances, Juno has to bear the suffering of existence. But unlike Captain Boyle, she does not um, romanticize her son's exploitation when Johnny drags on his sacrifice for Ireland by saying that he would sacrifice his other arm too because our principles are principle. Juno speaks bitterly. Ah, you lost your best principle, my boy, when you lost your arm. Right? So here um, we are taken back to what Okese is advocating in this play. He um, he dislikes war, no matter for what noble cause it is. His um, statement of um, uh, what he wants to bring in front is that no matter how noble the reasons are, in any case the loss is of lives and the loss is of society and then the loss is of generations. So that is what is being told here that uh, principles are made for men men are not made for principles so if you find um, we find Johnny calling here that no matter if he has lost one of his arms he's he's now ready to lose his other arm as well but his mother um, says um, it is of no use if you losing your arm will not bring us any good will not solve the issue will not make us win the war so it is useless here um, we have female representation where women are um, realistic and um, also disillusioned. Okese very beautifully portrays the high status of women that women are more realistic in their approach to life in general and to war in particular. So um, here we see um, though Juno is an uneducated woman um, yet she holds her dignity and shatters the web of idealism attached to war and trade uni unionism. Um, when Mary emphasizes that a principle is a principle and tries to justify her call on strike, Juno remarks very realistically. When the employer sacrifices one victim, the trades union go one better be sacrificing a hundred. So what you are sacrificing for? Are you, you're not taking care of the people who are being victimized under this act of sacrifice. So this is what Juno presents and she's, be, she's being representative of Akesa's thoughts in the play. 
In the country like Ireland, which is poverty-stricken and war-ridden, one cannot afford any idealism. So, in, in order to keep idealism, you need to have particular kind of situations where at least hungry stomachs are being fed. When you are not having enough resources to feed people, how can you talk about idealism and how can you talk about politics and how you can talk about um, trade unionism? Rather, the poor have to have the practical approach and must work hard in order to survive. Instead of complaining, start working hard. That is what Okesi is presenting here. And break down the barriers of slavery. Nobody can take you up from, the, um, from a condition where you are being slaved unless you work hard. We see only Junu is conscious of this fact. When she asks Mary, what will the um, shopkeeper say when she says to him, our principles are principle? Juno is very conscious of the fact that the miseries of the Irish people are not because of their stars, but they are because of their carelessness, misdeeds, romanticism and idealism. That's why she asks Mary, ah, what can God do again, the stupidity of men, right? So. What these people think, they think that it's the misery, um, uh, you know, misery because of the position of stars and they are blaming the external forces and heavenly forces um, for the kind of misery they are in. However, Jinu says, it's not anything else but your own personal carelessness, misdeeds, romanticism, idealism and wish not to improve your own personal status. And she says, God do nothing but it's man's stupidity that makes him in the position where he is where he is in so we find mary's character in the play we see that mary's suffering are also caused by men she rejects jerry divine because she realizes the fact that jerry is not a type of man who will stand by her through thick and thin she realizes charlie bentham but he deceives her and leaves her absolute and with an illegitimate bond. Boyle's so-called questions of honor awaken only this on this moment and he frightens Juno of dangerous consequences of Mary if Mary does not leave the house. Now again another another string of uh, contrast be between appearances and reality. Um, and here Boyle's character again comes in front where he is afraid of the kind of consequences they'll have to face if Mary does not leave the house. Why? Because she has been into an illegitimate relation with a man and now when people will get to know about it, what kind of things they are going to face in the society, what kind of, um, what kind of threat to their honor is Mary's presence at home. However, what kind of dignity he's buying for his family is a question that Junu comes back with. So in all these circumstances, it is only Junu who stands besides her daughter. This shows Ukese feminine independence. That she's realistic instead of leaving her daughter um, unsheltered um, and, um, you know, just leaving her and throwing her out of her house. She takes care of her because she knows that she's the one only who can take care of her daughter. So we find Juno and the Peacock, a feministic play, and all, all the discussion, all this discussion leads us to conclude that women in Juno and the Peacock are realist and wiser than men. They have the awareness of life which men lack. This assumption of a case is not based on lie or any idealism because he shows it and his characters are reflecting the uh, society of 1923. In fact, Okese wants to stress and evoke women to follow their instinctive, instinctive feminine good sense that he believes in that women has and to play their part in the domain of modern life. That is what is the basic advocacy in, of um, Sean Okese in his writing.
Most people say, why do you put so much detail into things people can't see it? But every little thing that you do builds up the layers of believability of a world and creates the world. Actors have to believe that they are living in tenement in 1922, so everything around them has to feel like it's correct for that period. We often have to do Guinness on stage in the Irish plays, and it's just so difficult to fake. We found that in Nigeria, we're producing non-alcoholic Guinness. It works and it's non-alcoholic, so it solved all our problems. Basically, we decant this into a period Guinness bottle so that when it's actually poured, they can actually get ahead so it looks like they're pouring a real Guinness. She is calling, 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 in the wind and on the sea. Doing the Paycock is one of those plays that I think every generation needs to see at the Irish Theatre. And I ask myself that question. What is the stars? What is the stars? Juno the Paycock uh, is uh, a result of the first ever co-production between the two national theatres. This production marks the debut of eight Irish actors on the Abbey stage. Co-producing this amazing Irish play, I think, is significant. And it should be directed by Howard Davis. And it's also marking the debut of one of Ireland's renowned, internationally lauded uh, designers, Bob Crowley. It's a big deal to be here for the first time. It's a, a huge Georgian room that you'd find in Henrietta Street or North Great Georgia Street. It's got a kind of a falling down, filthy, infested grandeur. And you're seeing about nearly 300 years of decrepitude. The world premiere of Juno uh, happened at the Abbey Theatre, so it's very much a part of uh, the family jewels, it's part of our legacy. Juno and the Paycock marks the return of Sinead Cusack to the Abbey stage. It's uh, well over 40 years since she was last here. She's done every major Shakespearean lead, uh, but has never uh, done no Casey on the stage. What was so extraordinary about O'Casey is he, he put the working class central to all his plays. Quiet! For your mother's sake! He does it with humour and he does it with compassion and he does it with, oh, wit. I mean, he's just, he's brilliant. What is the stars? What is the star? The relevance of the play just strikes me every time I do it. All the politicking and the posturing that was going on then is still going on now. And there are evictions and repossessions and all the things that happen in the play are happening on a daily basis here in Ireland. It shows the whole country is in a state of justice. They have nothing, you know, they have absolutely nothing. It's in within living memory that people lived in these extraordinary houses, you know, 100 people living in one house with no running water, T 10, 20 people in a room maybe sometimes. It takes this woman, Juno Boyle, to hold this tiny nuclear family together under the most appalling circumstances. But it's a love letter, you know, it is ultimately a love letter really from O'Casey to his mother, I think.